Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. My, na uh, my name is Lisa Dunseth, and on behalf of the staff of Book Arts and Special Collections, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. I'd also like to invite you all to come back on the first Saturday of February. We will have our second annual Valentine broadside printing event, and you're all invited. But right now, I'd like to uh, introduce George King Fox, who's going to say a, a bit about his father, George Marshall Fox, his connection to the McLaughlin brothers, and how the Fox collection came to the San Francisco Public Library. George will also introduce our speaker today, Laura Waswicks, who is with us all the way from Worcester, Mass., where she works at the American Antiquarian Society. She's going to talk about the McLaughlin brothers and their place in uh, American printing history. After her talk, you're all invited upstairs to the sixth floor, uh, the Skylight Gallery for reception, where you can also see the exhibition entitled Educate, Amuse, and in Colors. So right now, please welcome George Fox. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and <coughs> welcome. Nice to see you all here today. Um, I just wanted to say, give a little history of the uh, of the collection and how my father got started and how it all evolved and how it ended up here in San Francisco from Massachusetts. Can you all hear me well? There. Is that better? Okay. Um, <coughs> In 1891, my grandfather, George Albert Fox, began his employment as the foreman of the printing department of the Milton Bradley Company, manufacturers and publishers of children's games and school supplies in Springfield, Massachusetts. Rising up through the company to 1917, when he was appointed head of the game department, a position he held throughout his life until his passing in 1946. As a young executive, he maintained constant vigilance over his competitors and closely followed the operations of McLaughlin Brothers Publishers in New York City. McLaughlin began publishing books and games in, 19, in 1828 and enjoyed prosperity and remarkable growth until the 1907 death of founder John McLaughlin. Following this, the company control fell into the hands of his two sons who were more interested in other investments than running a company. And a few years later, the firm was offered for sale. George A. Fox was interested, saw the value of the company, and supposedly spearheaded the purchase of the stock, plates, machinery, and goodwill of McLaughlin by Milton Bradley Company in 1920. The materials were brought up to Springfield from Brooklyn, and the best of the games were added to the Bradley line. A subsidiary company retaining the McLaughlin name was formed, and five Bradley executives were given stock and management responsibilities to oversee the continuation of the publishing business. In 1923, my father, George Marshall Fox, joined the McLa Milton Bradley Company, and by this time, Bradley was more interested in developing new business and had lost interest in maintaining the old archives of McLaughlin Brothers. In the process of disposition, the collection was divided up between Charles Miller and my father, George M. Fox. Miller retaining much of the original artwork and my dad owning the books and the original woodcuts. Luckily, a large portion of the artwork found its way into the collection of the American Antiquarian Society in Massachusetts, where it is now preserved for scholarly use, of which you will hear more from Laura. Having this collection as a nucleus has set my father into the collecting mode, and throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, he added to the collection, largely by purchasing early children's books published prior to the McLaughlin period, as well as some English material, all the while being the good steward of the McLaughlin books. Copies of invoices here in the library's collection show him buying from the major dealers and juveniles of the day, among them Everett Whitlock of New Haven, Connecticut, Charles Tuttle of Vermont, and A.S.W. Rosenbach of New York, as well as the many small dealers scattered throughout New England. 
he became friends with fellow collector Wilbur Macy Stone and miniature book collector James D. Henderson. Correspondence between them indicates a certain amount of visitation between each, as well as the occurrence of friendly horse trading of duplicate material. During the 1938 New England hurricane and flood, the Connecticut River overflowed its banks and flooded downtown Springfield and into the basement floor of the Milton Bradley warehouse where the McLaughlin woodcuts were stored in wonderful old dovetailed wooden boxes. The woodcuts floated out like little toy boats and some were destroyed. But fortunately, my dad quickly hired a truck with helpers and the majority of the blocks were saved from the floodwaters and removed to the second floor of the garage at our nearby residence on Maple Street. In the 1970s, after my father's retirement, the book collection and the woodcuts were removed to our seldom farm in East Charlemont, Massachusetts. And in the early 80s, the subject of the future of the collection raised its head. After considerable discussion, it was decided to gift the collection to the San Francisco Public Library and the New York children's book specialist Justin Schiller was engaged to do the inventory and appraisal. I, of course, was living here, and at that time, the library had just acquired the Robert Grabhorn collection of the history uh, and development of the book. And there was a very active group of people who had started a monthly series of lectures and discussions called the Seminar and the History of the Printed Book, using the Grabhorn collection as a focal point for the discussions. Attractive announcements were voluntarily printed by the participants, and it was a wonderful period of conviviality and spirit devoted to the printed book. I realized then that the Fox Collection would make a great addition to the Grabhorn Collection as it would fill a gap covering the history of color printing in America. Meanwhile, the Woodcut Collection was sold to dealer Justin Schiller in New York, who pulled proofs of many of the blocks, matched them up with their printed books, and sold them largely to institutions. Schiller then sold the remaining part of the collection to Dawson's Bookshop in Los Angeles, and Muir Dawson continued to pull proofs, sell individual blocks, and publish a portfolio of these woodcut prints, in an addition of, I believe, 25 copies, one of which we gave to the Fox Collection here. After the books arrived in San Francisco, the library held an exhibition of picture books from the collection with an opening reception on December 9th, 1986, in the old library where James Silverman, librarian at UCLA, presented a lecture on the collection, followed by a reception. Many thanks to Lisa Dunseth and the present curatorial staff for this first retrospective exhibition of the Fox Collection since 1986. And so we welcome uh, Lisa Wasowicz to, excuse me, to Laura Wasowicz. Laura, why did I think it was Lisa? Lisa Dunseth. I, we have Lisa Dunseth and Laura Wasowicz. So to introduce Laura, uh, she is the curator of children's literature at the American Antiquarian Society. And for the past 25 years, she has worked to acquire, catalog, and make accessible the Society's unparalleled collection of American children's uh, books published between the 17th and early 20th centuries. She holds a master's, master's degrees from the University of Chicago and Clark University in Worcester. Laura, we welcome you. All right, can you hear me? Almost. All right. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, as we're in the thanking mode, I would like to thank George K. Fox for inviting me to come to San Francisco Public Library and deliver this talk. In no, in no small way, preparing this talk has crystallized my thinking about McLaughlin Brothers picture books after 25 years of buying them, researching them, and helping scholars to use them. I also want to thank San Francisco Public Library Special Collections Program Manager Lisa Dunseth for all of her gracious assistance. 
And finally, I want to thank American Antiquarian Society curator of graphic arts and dear colleague, Lauren Hughes, for sharing her expertise in the area of 19th century chromolithography. She helped me to navigate the technical background behind what I was seeing in the evolution of these McLaughlin Brothers color illustrations, and I am very much indebted to her insight. The goal of my talk today is to explain how McLaughlin Brothers nearly single-handedly transformed the American picture book from a vehicle for humble hand-colored wood engraving, like the one you see on the left, to an evocative medium for chromolithography, like the picture book on the far right. Not only is it a fine example of multicolor lithography, it is a sophisticated cover that incorporates several elements of the Cinderella story in a single design. In the middle of uh, this, this cover for the talk is a delightfully confounding design that bridges the gap between the two approaches to 19th century picture book design. Behind these books are effective marketing strategies that McLaughlin used to sell and promote their books, and I will be touching on some of them in my talk as well. Okay. You might ask, why did George ask me to fly out from the less glamorous surroundings of Worcester, Massachusetts to deliver this talk? I am curator of children's literature at the American Antiquarian Society, and AAS was founded in 1812 by printer and collector Isaiah Thomas to collect, preserve, and make accessible the printed word and image produced in colonial America and the United States from the early extant incidents of printing in British North America, which would be 1640, the Bay Psalm book, the title that everyone's talking about right now, through 1876, the centennial year. Now, in carrying out this mission, we have built a comprehensive collection of some 24,000 American children's books, including some 1,500 McLaughlin Brothers picture books. Now, as many of you might have already guessed, our McLaughlin picture books present a substantial exception to the end date of 1876. We actively collect McLaughlin Brothers picture books issued through the year 1899. The Fox Collection of Picture Books and the American Antiquarian Society Collection of McLaughlin Books share an important source, the McLaughlin Brothers Business Archives. And the history of these collections are rooted in the history of McLaughlin Brothers. The founder and catalyst of entrepreneurial energy and innovation was the man on the screen, John McLaughlin, Jr. Born in 1827, he learned wood engraving and printing as a teenager while working for Elton and Company, a New York firm formed by his father, John McLaughlin Sr., and engraver printer Robert H. Elton. Elton and Company, which was active from 1840 until 1851, printed and issued pictorial toy books as well as comic almanacs and valentines. Between, between 1850 and 1851, John McLaughlin Sr. and Robert H. Elton retired, giving John McLaughlin Jr. control of the business. He started to publish picture books under his own name and soon acquired the printing blocks of Edward Dunnigan, a New York picture book publisher for whom Robert Elton had executed, executed many wood engravings. And we will see if an example of a John McLaughlin reissue of a Dunnigan picture book in a few minutes. According to John McLaughlin Jr.'s 1905 obituary in Publishers Weekly, he made his younger brother, Edmund McLaughlin, a partner in 1855. However, the firm was not listed in New York City directories as McLaughlin Brothers until 1858. During the early, early years of their partnership, the product line extended to include non-book toys such as games, blocks, and paper dolls. By 1863, the firm had expanded from its original headquarters, which you see here in the, in the photograph, at uh, 24 Beekman Street to include 30 Beekman Street in New York. John McLaughlin Jr. continually experimented with color illustration, progressing from hand stenciling to the mechanized process of chromolithography using steam presses. 
In light of the firm's commercial and creative development, McLaughlin Brothers moved several times over the next few years, first to 52 Green Street in May 1870, then to 71 Duane Street in February 1871. And also in 1871, the McLaughlin firm opened a color printing factory at South, 11 and South 11th and Berry Streets in Brooklyn. This factory employed as many as 75 artists and served as a chief site of the firm's experimentation with color reproduction technologies. By the 1880s, McLaughlin books were regularly featuring titles in large folio formats illustrated by chromolithography. A number of titles were what we would call pirated editions of picture books originally issued in England by firms like George Routledge and Sons and Frederick Warren. After Edmund McLaughlin's retirement in 1885, the firm's New York office was moved several more times over the next 20 years to various locations on Broadway. And I can regale you with those addresses at the reception afterwards. But why am I going on and on about these addresses? Well, we'll see in a minute. Um, the firm did receive some new leadership when John McLaughlin Jr.'s sons, James G. and Charles, joined the firm. McLaughlin Brothers reached its commercial apex between 1880 and 1900, and their inventory included hundreds of picture books of varying sizes and extensive paper toy line, which included card games, boards, games, puzzles, and paper dolls. Now, after John McLaughlin Jr.'s death in 1905, the McLaughlin firm suffered from the loss of his artistic and commercial leadership. In 1920, as George just mentioned, the firm was sold to game publisher Milton Bradley, the Brooklyn factory was closed, and the company was moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, with this sale, the McLaughlin game inventory was taken over by Milton Bradley, although the publication of picture, picture books under the McLaughlin name continued. McLaughlin Brothers enjoyed some success in the 1930s with mechanical paper toys called Jolly Jump Ups, and you can still see these things in book dealers' catalogs and, in, and at um, ephemera shows. But the McLaughlin division of Milton Bradley stopped production largely during World War II, and eventually the last legal holder of the McLaughlin name, as far as I know, is Grosset and Dunlap. And here we are, the cast of characters. Um, sometime between the publication of, Mac of the McLaughlin Brothers Company History, 100 Years of Children's Books, which was published in 1928, and the year 1951, and I, I mean, and according to George's uh, records, it seems like it was closer probably to 1928 or 1930. The McLaughlin, um, the McLaughlin Brothers executive officers divided amongst themselves the firm's archival collection of books. And why I mention 1951 is because the McLaughlin line was sold to toy manufacturer Julius Kushner in 1951. And this, this treasure trove of company archives included books, games, original artwork, company correspondence, illustration blocks, and paper dolls. Two McLaughlin executives in particular, George A. Fox, who you see on the lower right, which is George K. Fox's grandfather, and Charles Miller, who you see on the upper left, the gentleman with the spectacles, are associated respectively with the San Francisco Public Library collection and the AAS collection. And that's a great picture of George M. Fox, who is George K. Fox's father. And uh, he, he, also, um, he also worked for McLaughlin Brothers, um, as George mentioned. And um, George M. Fox divided up this archival collection with Charles Miller. The Milton Bradley factory took, as George K. Fox just mentioned, a devastating hit during the hurricane of 1938. And George M. Fox, to his credit, saved many of those McLaughlin pieces by literally fishing them out of the river. Now, unfortunately, the all-important McLaughlin brothers' business records were apparently destroyed in this flood making the miraculous discovery in an idyllic future my ideal of the Holy Grail. Now, the other executive, Charles Miller, worked for McLaughlin Brothers for 65 years, starting as a printer's devil at age 16 and ending up as vice president of McLaughlin Brothers. He was clearly interested in the relationship between original artwork and finished product as a result. So as a result, AAS, has one of the largest institutional collections of McLaughlin drawings and proofs anywhere. 
Now here's a picture of him with the McLaughlin Brothers games inventory uh, circa 1900. Now I see some familiar faces in this picture, but there are a lot more that I wish I had found under my Christmas tree, but we have to keep buying. Let's see. Charles Miller's collection was eventually bought by Herbert Hosmer. Now Herbert was a creative and whimsical person. After getting a college degree from the Massachusetts College of Art, and he was an early teacher of Ted Kennedy at, at a private boys' school, so that shows how, you know, how long ago this was, he became an elementary school teacher eventually in Lancaster, Massachusetts. He was also a skilled puppeteer, and for many years he ran the Toy Cupboard Theater, which delighted generations of local children in Lancaster. He had a keen interest in the history of American children's books. Herbert first came to the American Antiquarian Society in the 1930s to do research on the career of his ancestor, John Green Chandler, who was a Boston engraver and book publisher who wrote and illustrated the remarkable story of Chicken Little. Herbert was a gifted raconteur. I would call him up on the phone with a question about McLaughlin Brothers, and he would regale me with stories about his ancestors before answering my question about 40 minutes later. Now, despite his lighthearted demeanor, Herbert was a serious collector, deadly serious. When he read Charles Miller's obituary in a newspaper in 1951, he immediately contacted um, Charles Miller's daughter, Ruth, he sent her a letter asking if his father had collected any McLaughlin materials that she would be willing to sell. She called him, <laughs> she called him 13 years later in 1964, asking if he was still interested in buying the collection. And she said, could you come tomorrow? Oh, that was such a story. Herbert gleefully set off to inspect the collection. And he writes, I made my way to Longmeadow, which is a suburb of Massachusetts, to call on Miss Miller and view her treasures. It had hardly seemed possible that all the McLaughlin items described to me by Miss Miller could actually exist, and I tried to hold my enthusiasm in check. However, it was all quite true. It was all exactly as she had told me it would be. I spent the entire day sitting cross-legged on the floor, going through carton after carton, as each one revealed unimagined delights and rarities. This collection was especially rich in the many series of books so popular at that time. Little books, big books, middle-sized books, and picture books, end quote. Miss Miller agreed to sell Herbert the collection. Now call it serendipity or kismet, but 1978 proved to be a watershed year for the preservation of the McLaughlin Brothers archive. As we just heard from George, in that year, George M. Fox donated his collection of picture books to San Francisco Public Library, and Herbert Hosmer donated his catch of Charles Miller McLaughliana to the American Antiquarian Society. The Hosmer donation included some 900 editions of McLaughlin picture books and about 1,000 pieces of artwork produced by McLaughlin Brothers between 1858 and 1920. Included in the donation were 30 McLaughlin Brothers publishers' catalogs, which proved to be positively critical in assigning accurate publication dates for many of the McLaughlin picture books. Which brings me to state three basic truths about McLaughlin Brothers. First, a comprehensive bibliography of McLaughlin Brothers has yet to be compiled. Being good businessmen, they rarely put a printed date on their picture books so that the stock could be easily sold over several years as brand new books, brand new books unencumbered by last year's date. Now, given their huge output, they published between 40 and 70 series between 1860 and 1890. So every year they'd be churning out anywhere between 40 series and 70 series. And each of those series could have anywhere between four and 50 titles each. So there is always something new to discover about McLaughlin Brothers. Be it a new title or a new edition, they would put things in cloth, they would put things in paper, they would put it in shaped, uh, as a shaped edition. It, there's always something new to discover. Now second, a definitive history of McLaughlin Brothers has yet to be written, mainly because those precious business records are simply not available. Which brings me to my third point. The best single source of information that we have about McLaughlin Brothers and their output are the books that they published, especially the Platehouse copies. See the Platehouse sign there? 
on it, like this one that were originally housed in New York and later in Springfield before landing in San Francisco or Worcester. And Lisa Dunseth has provided a whole wonderful case of examples of those for us to enjoy. Now, in order to, under, to underscore the McLaughlin brothers' importance as innovators, I'm going to briefly touch on the state of the American picture book before McLaughlin brothers arrived on the scene in the 1850s. Here is an, an image taken from an edition of Mother Goose's Melody published by American Antiquarian Society founder Isaiah Thomas's son, Isaiah Thomas Jr., in 1799. Isaiah Thomas Sr. was among the first American printers to print a line of children's books as a subspecialty. In fact, he reissued a lot of um, the uh, John Newberry's um, English chapbooks here in the United States under the Worcester, Massachusetts imprint. Now, this copy of Mother Goose is a typical example of a late 18th century picture book. It is only four inches tall. The illustration is a small, fairly crude woodcut. Woodcuts were economical in that they could be locked into a form with set type on a hand printing press, but the woodblock was fragile and tended to wear out very easily. Oh, isn't that stunning? I love it. This is an example of a metal engraved picture book issued by Philadelphia engraver and publisher William Charles in 1814. Now it's a bit bigger, it's five and a half inches tall. Both the images and the text are produced by a method known as intaglio, in which the image is scratched in, into a metal plate and that scratched plate is covered with ink and then wiped clean, leaving behind the lines of the image and the burned lines. Um, the inked metal plate is pressed onto paper and it receives those inked lines. Metal engravings require a separate press run from set type, making them more expensive to produce. In addition, these images are hand colored, adding labor costs to the book. William Charles sold his picture books plain for 18 and three quarter cents and colored for 25 cents, making this beautiful, his beautiful books beyond the means of many potential children's book consumers of that time. A third illustration technology emerged in the American market in the early 19th century, lithography. It was developed by Bavarian engraver Alois Senefelder in 1798, and this image of Santa Claus with his reindeer was issued by New York publisher William B. Gilley in 1821. And it's very, this is in our reserved collection at AAS, this is a very rare picture book. Um, and it was probably produced by America's first lithography firm of Armand Barnett and Isaac Doolittle. Lithography is a planographic process in which images are drawn directly onto a stone or a zinc plate using a grease pencil, giving the artist complete control over the printed product. The stone or plate is chemically treated so that ink only adheres to the grease pencil line. The image was then pressed from the stone or plate onto paper using a special press. In this image, both the illustration and the text below it are lithographed, and coloring was done by hand. Now, at six inches tall, this book is a tad taller than the metal engraved book we just saw, and the price was exactly the same as the metal engraved picture book, 25 cents colored. It would take the invention of lithographic steam presses and an influx of foreign workers to make a cheap color picture book both viable and profitable. Oh, come on. Which brings me to the remarkable story of Chicken Little. Remember I told you about Herbert Hosmer, his ancestor was John Green Chandler. This is John Green Chandler's book, The Remarkable Story of Chicken Little. And it was printed as um, in 18, the 1840s as a benefit for the Bunker Hill Monument. They, they were trying to raise money to, 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 build, to build the monument. So this John Green Chandler picture book exemplifies the state of color picture book publishing when John McLaughlin started working as an apprentice. By 1840, the technique of cutting an image on the end of a block of hardwood, like boxwood, had been perfected, allowing for clearer, more detailed, and longer lasting images. Also, both text and illustration could be further preserved and produced by making a metal stereotype plate of the entire image. This copy is about seven and a half inches tall, reflecting the industrialization of paper manufacture. However, the wood engraving of Chicken Little, we see here, 
is hand colored, and the means to produce an efficient and economical color printed illustration would present a conundrum to American publishers for several more decades. Enter John McLaughlin Jr. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he bought the printing stock of picture book publisher Edward Dunnigan. Here are the title pages for The Little Drummer. The one on the left was issued by Dunnigan in 1848, and the one on the right was published six years later by John McLaughlin, Jr. Even at this date, young McLaughlin is reaching for a way to make his book more colorful. Both the wood engraved illustrations are colored by hand, um, by hand using stencils. Now, while Dunnigan does well, a slapdash job using red, yellow, and blue, McLaughlin's copy is colored more neatly using those colors plus green. The inner pages reveal that while Dunnigan was satisfied with putting coloring on the title page and leaving the rest uncolored, McLaughlin colored every illustration with four colors. This ad for John McLaughlin, taken from another book published in the early 1850s, announces that he is a manufacturer of decorated paper products like great aprons, frame paper, valentines, along with children's toy books. It reflects his role as both an ephemera printer and book publisher, which is important considering that much of the innovation in color printing that occurred over the next several decades came from ephemera printers seeking new ways to produce color images cheaply. The popular fairy tale Cinderella will serve as our tour guide to chart the evolution of McLaughlin Brothers picture books in their halcyon period of color illustration innovation and book design between 1858 and 1900. The story of Cinderella has always sold and is a fine barometer of McLaughlin Brothers' use of illustration technologies and marketing strategies. My first example is taken from the 1854 John McLaughlin Jr. edition and the 1858 McLaughlin Brothers edition of Cinderella or the Glass Slipper. This book was probably printed from plates originally belonging to Edward Dunnigan. It has that look. <laughs> With its bold lettering and black line, hand-colored wood engravings, this Cinderella looks like countless other picture books issued in the 1840s and 50s. Both of these books were colored using stenciling. The McLaughlin Brothers edition on the right is more neatly done and has more colors, particularly in the background. It probably retailed for about eight cents a piece. Now we arrive at the meat of the matter. Between 1863 and 1866, McLaughlin Brothers started to issue the Fairy Moonbeam series, which includes this version of Cinderella. I have discovered that the Fairy Moonbeam series in particular contains critical evidence of McLaughlin Brothers' switch from wood engraving to chromolithography as their chief method of illustration. Now, in this Fairy Moonbeam's version of Cinderella from about 1863, the colors were printed from wood blocks. Here, this scene of the seated Cinderella is printed in basic red, yellow, and blue. The coloring is opaque and the application is even, unlike the hand-colored stencils, which tend to have uneven coloring. This scene of Cinderella and the prince dancing at the ball reveals the serrated lines of the blocks, particularly in the background. The registration of the colors, the way the colors fall within the black lines of the illustration, is fairly consistent. These pages would have needed to go through the press several times, once for the text and the outline key, and then for each color. In this case, Cinderella is packaged as part of a picture book anthology issued four years later in 1867, along with the fairy tales Hop O' My Thumb, Aladdin, and Sleeping Beauty. Now, I believe that it is significant that of those four titles, this scene from Cinderella was chosen as the cover illustration. Surely this scene of a pensive Cinderella at the fireside talking to a witch-like fairy godmother would have gained immediate recognition by buyers of all ages. I mean, I grew up with Cinderella and I said, oh yes, yeah, Cinderella, you know, instant. In instantaneous um, I, in, discovery of what the book is. This, okay, this folio picture book measuring 11 and 3 quarter inches tall, so it's a, it's a little folio book, contains the four stories. Each story is typeset in double columns and fits neatly onto two pages, followed by two pages of simple reading exercises. So this book was a hybrid of a primer and a picture book, thus making it an attractive purchase within two steady and related markets. 
The text of Cinderella and all but one of the illustrations appeared earlier in that 1863 edition of Fairy Moonbeam series that we just saw. One key difference is that in this case, the wood engravings were hand colored and rather sloppily so. It seems that the McLaughlin brothers, they were reaching for the, mo the most efficient means at the moment to color the illustrations and the higher technology of color relief printing did not always win. The back cover of this edition boasts of 300 children's picture books manufactured by McLaughlin Brothers. This is a bibliographic goldmine for you guys out there trying to date McLaughlin Brothers stuff. This is, this is just a great example of what they were doing. Such densely printed advertisements were common in McLaughlin books printed between the 1850s and about 1886. Cinderella, or the little glass slipper, appears four times in this advertisement, and I've marked it with the, with the arrows because the print is so tiny. It was published as an eight-cent toy book, a 10-cent toy book, a 15-cent toy book, and as an indestructible and more expensive linen book. This advertisement reflects McLaughlin Brothers' recognition of Cinderella as a popular story that would sell in a variety of formats at the same time. By 1867, John and Edmund McLaughlin started to transfer their wood engraved picture books over to the promising technology of chromolithography. Now, as seen in this Fairy Moonbeam series edition of Cinderella. Now, I have, boy, I have to admit, I was confounded by what was going on <laughs> with this illustration for a long time. At first glance, this illustration looks like the wood engraving from 1863, but the colors have the measly spotted texture of early chromolithographs, and the registration of colors are the best we have seen thus far in the, in the examples. But the text is almost certainly typeset on the same page as the illustrations. What is going on? Apparently, the text and the black illustration key comprising the outlines could have been stereotyped and the colors applied later using lithographic stones or plates. Unlike the woodblock printed colors, the colors in this ball scene have a translucent quality. The book was run through a printing press once and then through a lithographic press at least four more times, so the red, yellow, blue, and green. Gromo lithography was undergoing a transformation in the 1860s from a specialty technology primarily used for ephemera and separately published prints to a viable means of printing picture books. In the late 1850s, Boston lithographers L.H. Bradford and James Ambrose Cutting perfected the process of photolithography by which an image could be transferred to a photosensitized lithograph stone for eventual mass production. The development of steam-powered lithographic presses allowed for thousands of copies to be produced in a day. The stones or plates themselves were much more durable than woodblocks that wore down after several hundred impressions. Besides these technological developments, post-Civil War American lithography directly benefited from an influx of skilled foreign um, artists, lithographic artists from England and Europe. Boston lithographer Louis Prang was able to hire several key workers during a European trip that he made in the 1860s, and McLaughlin brothers likely had the same kind of economic advantage. In 1868, Louis Prang built a three and a half story lithographic factory in Boston, which included space for 45 presses. And three years later, in 1871, McLaughlin brothers built and supplied their own lithographic production factory in Brooklyn. It is conceivable that in 1867, McLaughlin Brothers might have been leasing the lithographic presses and that the Fairy Moonbeam series was used as a pilot to see how well the new chromolithographic method would work. Now, I'm going out on a limb here, I know that. But it, it, it really shows up in this one series, and that's why in my discussions with Lauren Hughes, we thought this, this might be the answer. In, 1870, in 1876, the series name changed, changed slightly to Fairy Moon Beam series, so it's singular. And these, these, little, these little distinctions are very critical if you want to date a whole pile of uh, McLaughlin Brothers books that don't have dates on them. Besides the name change, this edition of Cinderella was, was issued with a new cover featuring a scene from the story set in an elegant new decorative border. I mean, this 
This looks like it's, it's 1870s and beyond. You can just tell. Subtle but elegant, oh yes, okay. Subtle but elegant changes are made to the inner pages as well. The shades of red, as you can see, are richer and there is more variety of textures like the smoke that you see coming out of the tea kettle. The yellow ruled border is inserted around the text and opposite the first page of the text is a chromolithographed alphabet hearkening back to an earlier time like in the New England printer era, primer era where you would see a children's picture book, children's book um, issued with an alphabetic frontispiece. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, um, in this image of the ball, the color palette is much more significant, moving beyond the standard red, yellow, blue, green, and incorporating rich shades of pink and brown. A floral ornament is also inserted in the centerfold, making for a more elegant production. Meanwhile, back at the ranch at about the same time, this version of Cinderella was issued in the Little Dots series in about 1875 as a cheap one cent toy book, and it's small, it's six and a half inches tall. It contains the same text and illustrations as those issued in the Fairy Moonbeam series that we've been looking at, except for this title page design of a waif-like Cinderella contemplating her lot by the fireside. The title page is chromolithographed in red and blue ink to resemble a wrapper. The rest of the illustrations are simply the black key outline uncolored. This edition is unusual for McLaughlin books published in the 1870s in that it does not include a publisher's advertisement on the back page or on the back wrapper. There simply is no room amid the cramped text and illustrations. And my guess is that the publisher decided that the buyers of one cent toy books would be less likely to purchase more expensive picture books and concluded that making space for an advertisement would not be worth the trouble. At the very same time, there again, 1875, 1876, McLaughlin published this regal folio edition of Cinderella appearing in the Aunt Louisa series, and it's about 12 inches tall, so this is a really nice big picture book. For 25 cents, the lucky owner could enjoy six chromolithograph plates printed in what were fast becoming the trademark, trademark shades of McLaughlin books, rich reds, bright yellows, and deep greens. In this case, the illustrations appear as varnished plates, and we'll see that in a moment. And it is very clear that they were chromolithographed. He said, wow, yeah, that's chromolithography. This dramatic scene of Cinderella fleeing the palace at midnight is an ambitious design by McLaughlin Brothers staff artist Justin H. Howard. Actually, it is the only illustration that can be safely said to be drawn expressly for this McLaughlin issue, but more about that in a moment. Oh, I just love it. That's, that's great. Unlike the earlier editions shown, these plates have a panoramic feel. The sweet-faced Cinderella is set like a jewel in this grand ballroom scene. In fact, her two-dimensional surroundings resemble a theater backdrop. The plates must have gone through the lithographic presses numerous times to get those shades, and then it's varnished on top of it. These pictures have a posed look as though they could be used as a guide for the parlor tableau that were then in vogue for people who were having parties. It was right up there um, with, with shadow pictures and, and, and that kind of thing. You would have a, 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 a living tableau of a scene from a famous book. McLaughlin Brothers, as I mentioned earlier, developed a notorious reputation let's just say, as a publisher of unauthorized reissues of British picture books. They were pirates. In this case, the American printed McLaughlin editions of the Aunt Louisa series competed directly against the original Frederick Warren and Company issues imported from London by Scribner, Welford, and Armstrong, a branch of Charles Scribner and Company. Aunt Louisa was the pen name of English author Laura Jury Valentine, and at least some of those books were written or edited by her. But McLaughlin Brothers, they were quick to inject some Americana in their version of the Aunt Louisa series. And we will be taking a momentary departure from Cinderella to explore that point in a moment. In 1869, McLaughlin Brothers hired famed political cartoonist Thomas Nast to illustrate versions of The Night Before Christmas, Yankee Doodle, and Rip Van Winkle for their version of the Aunt Louisa series. 
And here is an example of Nast's illustration of Rip loafing with his trusty dog. This same image was used as a chromolithographed label pasted to the compilation issued in 1882 entitled Aunt Louisa's Child's Delight, which issued Yankee Doodle, Rip Van Winkle, and Worldwide Fables, which were all Aunt Louisa's stories in one elegant publisher's cloth binding at the price of $1.25. Now, as you can see, McLaughlin Brothers was a clever recycler of images devising different packages geared to a variety of desires and consumer budgets. The eagerness to repackage images can also be seen in the mobility of images between their book and game lines. The NAST illustrations were chromolithographed onto a scroll and turned into this panorama. To give it an even grander feel, McLaughlin Brothers hired William Momberger, a well-known American artist at that time, to design the proscenium frame and cover for the panorama. McLaughlin Brothers would use the proscenium frame design in their picture books, as we shall see shortly. They also manufactured toy theaters, and this frame design could cross over easily between picture books and paper toys. McLaughlin Brothers also used the work of British artists, as in this case of a likely unauthorized edition of Richard Andre's Cinderella from 1888. The Andre books are remarkable in that the text and the illustrations are lithographed as a unit and designed as an integrated whole. The cover design conveys several elements of the story in a collage of images, Cinderella, the pumpkin, the mice, and the lizard. Similarly, McLaughlin issued a similar edition of Andre's version of The Children in the Wood, that wonderful classic, and ever resourceful, McLaughlin turned the book images into a cube puzzle. And isn't that great? Now, as mentioned earlier, McLaughlin Brothers competed directly against the English picture book publisher Frederick Warren and Company, whose issues were imported from London by Scribner, Welford, and Armstrong, a branch of Charles Scribner and Company. And it is probably no accident at all that a vitriolic, vitriolic letter penned by English illustrator Walter Crane attacking the McLaughlin Brothers' gaudy and unauthorized reproduction of his baby's opera appeared in the September 1877 issue of Scribner's Monthly, and a transcription of that letter is on display. Thank you, Lisa. Now, not surprisingly, Charles Scribner II became an ardent advocate of an international copyright law, but until the American Copyright Law of 1891 guaranteed some rights for foreign holders, McLaughlin Brothers reigned as a pro prolific publisher of picture book pirate editions. So what was Walter Crane complaining about? Here we see the illustration and music for I Saw Three Ships, published in the London George Routledge and Sons edition. The illustrations are painstaking, painstakingly engraved on wood and printed in color by Crane's collaborator, Sir Edmund Evans. It is an elegant piece of color relief printing. Note the muted shades of yellow, violet, and peach worn by the three angels. In the hands of the McLaughlin brothers, Evans' wood engravings are turned into chromolithographs, and the colors are robust shades of purple, orange, and green. And that pale tint of the angel skin in Evans' hands, well, they become a much more lifelike hue in this McLaughlin brothers' version, giving the angels the look of actual young girls dressed like angels. And did Crane want that? Hmm. Both versions are beautiful, they're beautiful, but they are aesthetically an apple and an orange. And at 75 cents per copy, perhaps half the price of the Routledge edition, the McLaughlin version was a heck of a lot cheaper to produce and to purchase. As could be imagined, Cinderella remained a key player in the McLaughlin Brothers' business program in the 1880s. By 1882, Cinderella was represented in just about every price category of picture books published by McLaughlin Brothers. According to the catalog of McLaughlin Brothers' toy books issued in 1882, versions of Cinderella were published in various series costing one cent, 10 cents, 12 cents, and 25 cents. In addition, Cinderella was published as part of the Bound Storybook Collection's Fairy Moonbeam Storybook at 50 cents each, and Aunt, Louise, Aunt Louise's Fairy Legends at $1.50 each. The Cinderella image also graced an Andre cube puzzle, like the one we saw of the children in the wood, and a paper doll book. But the crowning jewel of the Cinderella picture books issued in that year was 
that published in the chromolithographed pantomime, pantomime toy book series. This series of metamorphic picture stories containing five set scenes and nine trick changes contained well-known tales such as Aladdin, Sleeping Beauty, Bluebeard, and Puss in Boots. At 35 cents a piece, these books were the most expensive of the short, which is up to 25 pages, 25-page um, long book that McLaughlin Brothers produced. Apparently, this series is a copy, probably also unauthorized, of a series published in the early 1870s by the London firm of Dean and Company. The cover design of this McLaughlin issue of the pantomime series, Cinderella, signals a more modern phase in McLaughlin picture book production in that it integrates title and series with both words and pictures. And as you can see in the artful layout of Cinderella at her hearth with adjacent insets of a herald carrying the magic slipper, you know, hearkening to the end of the story, as well as two well-known pantomime characters to signal that it's part of the pantomime toy book series. This, these wonderful pictures are printed in a series of three quarter and a half size pages that are set within two full size leaves printed with the proscenium frame complete with orchestra pit, thus simulating the feeling of viewing the action from a theater seat. Now, surely McLaughlin Brothers made some adaptation to suit American taste, including the American shield and the Liberty banner that you see at the proscenium center on the top. The book's multi-leveled pages flip open to the triumphant slipper fitting, and it pushes the boundaries between movable book and panorama. McLaughlin Brothers reached its innovative peak in the 1890s as this folio-shaped picture book Cinderella so beautifully attests. Shaped in the form of a theater proscenium, this book has two spines and the leaves cut in half lengthwise so that the lucky reader gets the feeling of opening a special curtained world. And the dimensions are 12 and a half inches tall by by um, 10 and 1 8 inches wide, so it's, it's a big book. As you can see from the cover, not only did McLaughlin Brothers copyright this pictorial verse edition in 1891, but it also patented the format on November 10th of the same year. So both the visual material and the physical format were protected. Like the pantomime Cinderella, the, the reader is given the feeling of sitting in a theater with the orchestra playing in the pit. Upon opening, the inner covers and leaf versos, versos are printed with the lithograph uh, designs of theater goers watching the drama from box seats, underscoring the theater's status as an entertainment palace acceptable for the entire family. So note the mother, father, and children on the left, and the grandmother and the children on the right. This is family entertainment. Now, by the 1890s, McLaughlin used photographic techniques to expand or contract images for different effects, as seen in this 1896 edition of Cinderella, published as part of the Red Riding Hood series. Scenes from three books in the series, um, Cinderella, Puss in Boots, and Red Riding Hood, decorate the cover. Inside is a collage of chromolithographs conveying the entire story without words. I mean, it does have words. It has text. It's surrounded by pages of text. But in the middle, there's just this, this two-leaf two, um, two fold um, spread of, a, of this collage. And it can tell you the entire story. The colors are pastel shades that were commonly used by the firm at that time. And that's often how you can tell a McLaughlin Brothers picture book um, made in the 1890s, that the shades tend to be a bit, a bit lighter, a lot of blue, light blues, pinks, that sort of thing. The text is illustrated by photo-reduced outline versions of the illustration. So what we saw, see? Uh, see, oh, ah. see her in the middle with, the, with her uh, broom? Ah. And then? There she is, down at the bottom, reduced. OK. The image of Red Riding Hood appears on the back cover of this book, visually branding the book from start to finish. And that's the whole thing of visual recognition, not just of the, of the words printed out of the series, but also um, the illustration, so you can tell right off what series it belongs to. 
McLaughlin Brothers continued to hire well-known North American artists to produce original artwork for them. And to capitalize on the success of English artist <coughs> Kate Greenaway's picture books, and we'll see some of that upstairs, um, McLaughlin hired Philadelphia artist Ida Waugh to create a rival series featuring gentle, idealized pictures of children at play. <coughs> Waugh, along with her contemporary Mary Cassatt, exhibited at the Women's Building at the 1893 Columbian Exposition. So she, she was on par with Mary Cassatt. Think about that. Um, similarly, the firm enlisted the talents of Canadian illustrator Palmer Cox to design the Brownie Yearbook in 1895 to chronicle the adventure of the Brownies, mythical little people representing nationalities and stereotype personalities as, such as the Dapper Dude, shown here in Cox's watercolor drawing on the left, the book cover you see in the center, and then the patented stand-up wooden doll you see on the right. And then there are the artists and the books that somehow fell in between the cracks, as in this case of a wonderful watercolor drawing for the Three Bears, designed by an artist known only by her or his last name, Grosvenor. Apparently, this version never made it into print, but thankfully, all of the drawings are held at the American Antiquarian Society. In the meantime, Cinderella continued to sell McLaughlin books. A review of the McLaughlin Brothers Publishers Catalog issued in 1914 reveals that at least on the surface, Cinderella was just as popular and just as marketable as ever. The story was represented in two two-cent series, one three-cent series, and four five-cent series. There were three 15-cent series, including the Cinderella series, which dates back to at least the 1860s. The story was also represented in three hardcover editions, including two anthologies. This issue from circa 1917 exemplifies McLaughlin Brothers' attempt to modernize its inventory. This gorgeous cover design features Cinderella as an art nouveau, nouveau, nouveau beauty, art nouveau beauty, busily fleeing the palace. I just love that, that illustration. While her coach and attendants form a gently humorous frame as you can see in this square frame there. But you open it up, and what do you see but the illustrations from the 1891 proscenium shape book and the text from the 1896 edition from the Red Riding Hood series. Now, one of the only McLaughlin Brothers manuscripts ext extant in the American Antiquarian Society's collection is a draft of a letter probably written by McLaughlin executive Charles Miller in 1919, and it's on the chaotic state of the firm's production. At this point, John McLaughlin had been dead for 14 years. His son, as we know, Charles McLaughlin, had died in 1914, so he went away. And Charles' brother James, as George mentioned earlier, had outside interests that left him little time or desire to oversee the publishing business. Now, according to that memo draft, the firm's Brooklyn plant was underutilized and production quality suffered from the waste of raw materials, inefficient resource management, and a profound lack of supervision. So they were treading water. But at the same time, other publishers on both sides of the, of the Atlantic gleefully gained com commercial ground. Now here on the left, we see the cover of Clifton Bingham's The Animal's Trip to Sea, illustrated by G.H. Thompson. This was published as part of a truly international collaboration between New York firm E.P. Dutton and & Company and London publisher Ernest Nister, who printed, at, printed this at his plant in Bavaria in about 1900. Shortly thereafter, a French edition was issued by famed picture book Paris publisher Hachette. Without the guidance and drive of John McLaughlin Jr., the ship of McLaughlin faltered, never to regain its commercial corner on the American picture book market. There were other people willing to pick up the pieces on both sides of the Atlantic. To their credit, the McLaughlin executives tried to revitalize the McLaughlin book line after the firm's sale to Milton Bradley in 1920. And a company history titled 100 Years of Children's Books was published in 1928. And it is a wonderful um, source of information about McLaughlin Brothers. And any McLaughlin collection worth its salt needs to have that book. 
Now, the premise of this history, though, was a bit spurious, um, as it promoted the firm's start date as being 1828, the supposed date that John McLaughlin Sr. started printing children's books, although I have found no evidence of children's books actually issued under John Sr.'s name. It was all under Elton and Company later on. The history does include a revised catalog of McLaughlin Brothers picture books touted as the Centennial Line, and here it is, the Centennial Line. However, if you look closely, um, the line includes shaped books of animals and mother goose that you see up in the upper right hand corner and that those were they those actually were first published in the, during the McLaughlin heyday of the 1890s so it's really from the past childhood looks for McLaughlin books I found this slogan at the end of a McLaughlin salesman's price list for 1930 it struck me that in the decades between 1850 and 1930 Childhood emerged as an identifiable cultural concept with an implied consumer aspect. The word childhood first finds its way into American children's books through 18th century editions of Isaac Watts's catechism entitled A Preservative from the Sins and Follies of Childhood and Youth. And the concept of childhood was, was steadily used in the writing of didactic literature advocating self-reflection and moral behavior. It was the development of an international children's book market with creative and entrepreneurial publishers like McLaughlin Brothers that provided the distinct material culture of childhood. Not only did McLaughlin Brothers publish books containing pictures, now many other 19th century publishers did just that. No, more than that, they produced picture-dominated books, frequently in color, significantly escalating the expectation of picture book consumers that they could get an image-laden book in color at an affordable price ranging anywhere between one penny and 75 cents, many of them in the five to 20 cent price range. Furthermore, McLaughlin Brothers built an inventory of several hundred titles. And as we, can, we have seen with Cinderella, they created different editions of popular fairy tales to match the widest possible array of price brackets. The technological innovations of chromolithography and photographic reproduction were absolutely critical to McLaughlin Brothers' successful mass production of picture books and the transfer and recycling of picture book images to other media like games and paper toys. <clears throat> These innovations allowed for the images to be printed in a variety of contexts, including visual collages and back cover illustrations, creating a distinctly visual way of understanding the story and branding a series that was not so widely present in earlier picture books. Now, although McLaughlin liberally pirated English picture books, they, they also published and promoted the careers of American artists like Thomas Nast, giving a distinctly American, even patriotic, feel to the multicolor picture book. In no small way, McLaughlin Brothers gave us the expectations that we now have for picture books as a, cult as a cultural necessi necessity of American childhood. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for uh, staying with me through this, and uh, it, it's been quite a, a ride for me. This is 25 years encapsulated into, what, 45 minutes? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but I'm, I, I will take a few minutes of questions if any, anybody has any questions or any questions I can answer. <laughs> and it's very interesting, because I was talking to Lisa Dunseth about this. It seems like the bulk of the Fox collection, as it came here, Many of them are from the English competitors. And, but there's a good, you know, it's a nice percentage of, of, of material that are McLaughlin items, but these are from, all from the McLaughlin Brothers archives, and they were businessmen, and they needed to know what the competition was doing. If you go to Worcester, it seems like the percentage is kind of flipped, maybe. I mean, it's all, well over half, maybe three quarters of the books that we got from Charles Miller and from Herbert, Ho um, Herbert Hosmer. About three quarters are McLaughlin books. A lot of them are Playhouse copies. And about a fourth, and probably less than a fourth, are the English and French and German competitors. So these are symbiotic collections. I would, I mean, from what I have, little I've seen, these, it, these collections, the San Francisco collection and the Worcester collection, are yin and yang. 
They, they really, you, you will, you, you should look at both of them to get a very clear idea of the output, the desires of McLaughlin Brothers, because often, often the Playhouse copies will have the blue pencil editing of how to make things more American. We, Lisa has an excellent example of that upstairs. And then, and then of the English competitors as well. And, and why was Walter, why the heck was Walter Crane, you know, yammering on? Well, he had, he had a right to yammer. They, they really, they changed his illustrations in a way that he probably did not like at all. So, <laughs> it, 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 what? Oh, it was, that's exactly what he called, he calls it vulgar. He was teed off, I mean, and you, and you gotta understand too, he was losing money. Because um, you know Scribner, Welford and Company, they were the, they were, the Amer they were importers of foreign books, and they were going. They, they, he wanted those books to sell, and instead, the cheap copy made by McLaughlin Brothers was that's what was selling like hotcakes because it apparently was a lot cheaper. Does anybody know where the McLaughlin Brothers business, you know, their their ledger books are? I'm <laughs> I, this is this is something that has confounded me for years. I I I, I was telling George, um, people would come in, and they would um, they would say, "Oh, I'm here to write the McLaughlin Brothers history. I'm I'm going to write it. Show me where where are those ledger books?" And I said, "Well, they're they're not here, and maybe the Fox Collection. You know, maybe the Fox Collection has them. You know, but uh, apparently, no, that did, that didn't work out either. And they would just and then the, and then I would direct them to Herbert Hosmer. You know, take a drive and see Herbert over in Lancaster and see if he can and." I'm sure Herbert regaled him with a lot of wonderful anecdotes, but that was about it. And and I would never see these people again. So that's so I for so that's why I'm kind of like the uh, de facto expert here on McLaughlin Brothers. Uh, and and I mean I can't stress this enough. Uh, McLaughlin Brothers, you learn by doing. I mean those those publishers catalogs they are not sexy things to look at, but they are damn sexy when you start to think bibliographically about the books. Most of these things don't have dates on them, and that's why I was going on and on about the different addresses. The cheap forms, you know, I was talking to Lisa yesterday, you know, how do you date these books? You, you can use a variety of, of ways that, and, and a, a generally a combination of two or more will work. Uh, you use the, av um, the advertisements on the back, what is advertised as, at new and as new and at what price. You use the addresses. If you're really lucky, they're going to have an address on it. Um, and then there, there are inventory numbers on these, and I didn't get into that, but there are inventory numbers on a lot of the McLaughlin books from about the 1880s onward um, that they're either three or four digits long. They're generally on the front cover or the back cover. And then using those um, inventory numbers, you can go to the publisher's catalogs and rifle through them and see where, where those line up under what series. So that's also very important. And there was a time in the late 1890s, early 1900s, when they renumbered the, the entire inventory, and that's another key change. So that, it's, it's very nuts and bolts, nitty gritty sort of work that one has to do in, in order to date these things properly. And it, it's not glamorous work, but um, it is, that's what you have to do in order to, to catalog them right. I feel like I'm a victim of my own success. I know there are some dealers in the audience. Um, I, a lot, when I first came to AES, uh, the collection was not cataloged. And that was back in 1987. And so it was up to me to figure out how the heck to catalog these things. And um, you look at a dealer's catalog and they would have like the widest possible range, you know, McLaughlin Brothers, 1840s to 1900, question mark. And then, but, that, but as time went by and I started putting in the records, I started to see, you know, between 1858 and 1862, you know, and I thought, oh man, they're on to me. They're starting to look at the AES catalog and, and, and in a way I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, um, for the prices going up. I think because people really know what's going on with these things. And then more people discover they use them. They, they, and uh, Robin Bernstein and her uh, professor at Harvard in her recent book um, on uh, performing, um, performing race. It's like the, 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 the um, it's a cultural history of children's literature and the role that it had in either promoting um, abolition or promoting racism. It was used on both sides to do that. And she worked heavily with the McLaughlin Brothers picture book collection. And uh, 
she had no idea that it was so, the McLaughlin brothers' titles in particular were such a treasure trove for um, aspects of race and sex role. So these, these are immensely important um, picture books. And Lisa asked me to really zero in on the, on the printing history, the publishing history, which I have endeavored to do. But there's also a lot of social and cultural history going on in these books, and they are transatlantic in nature. I mean, that's another thing I want to get across. Um, you go into uh, one of the hottest titles now, if you're collecting picture books, is uh, Ten Little Niggers and Nine Niggers More. These were counting out rhymes, and there was, <laughs> there was nothing, no, nobody found that upsetting uh, back when these books first started coming out in the 1870s. But the thing is, these had English antecedents, and that's another thing. When you deal with McLaughlin Brothers, there's often a good chance that it's, it's based on an English work. So Americans did not have um, uh, the, the corner, they didn't corner the market on what a modern day person would call racism. It's a, it's, it was a cultural milieu uh, shared on both sides of the Atlantic. So these are um, immensely important works. And uh, please, please come out to Worcester. I'd, I'd be happy to, to tell you more about it. And uh, it's just, it's a magnificent collection. It's, 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 it, the McLaughlin Brothers, they are just so, they are seminal. And George understands this. That's, yes, George. But they are, some, they are a seminal firm in the history of color print technology. They were American innovators. And uh, the thing is, it, the children's picture book, uh, why I went into the, all the detail and talking about what became, you know, like Isaiah Thomas and all that stuff, and, and John Green Chandler, is because often people, they'll just jump in in, in, in the 1860s starting to look at McLaughlin books. So they, oh, they look like the picture book. They kind of look like the picture books that I saw growing up. Oh, and it's not that. But the whole thing is, they gave us that modern picture book that we enjoy right now. And what there were, what I would call a picture book as a as a curator and as a cataloger is probably what, not what a lot of you would call a picture book. Picture book is a is a, is a, a a book that is, it's conceived so that the image is absolutely necessary to conveying the message of the text. The text and the image are symbiotic, and but that. That means, that it doesn't mean that there's necessarily going to be big illustrations or color illustrations. And McLaughlin Brothers gave us the big and the colorful. So, so that's, that's it. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.